you've already clicked it. I'm just going to put the link here sure. in LinkedIn so that if Dan happens to see this, he can join us. Yeah, absolutely. And hello, everybody. Welcome to the fourth edition of Introduction to Esports. Uh, we have a very special guest today, which is Marcus. He's been here with all of us for every single episode, but he is the main guest of today. Marcus, do you want to give a more Super Mario Bros. 3 ask formal introduction for this episode? <laughs> Well, since you asked, sure. So my name is Marcus Howard. Welcome, everyone. If you've been tuning in for the last three weeks, you've already seen me for three weeks. But if you're new to this show, this podcast series, welcome. My parents got me Super Mario Brothers 3 for Christmas when I was six. And I've been playing video games ever since. And that led me to become a technologist, a, a junior technologist, if you will, as a kid. And that led me to become a, a junior coder. And, you know, long story short, and I've been writing code 15 years and working in technology for 15 years and playing video games my whole life. That's pretty cool. Now, for every, okay, for every episode, you've had a jacket on, which looks very business formal, but then you've had some type of animated t-shirt underneath it. So is that the aesthetic that you're going for? Is that just the shirt you find in the morning and then put the jacket on for sessions? How does this work? I, I do that. You're right. You, you caught on to that very quickly. It's, I call it business casual, Heard. right? Because I want people to take me seriously, right? In mm -hmm. the esports ecosystem, when you go to a business, like a local business, like a bank or or a restaurant or whatever. But I also want them to understand that I'm from the culture. Or if it's someone who I'm talking to, like at a Microsoft store, and it's an actual gamer working at the Microsoft store, I want them to know I'm just not a suit. You know, I play video games. I'll tell you about the warp pipes, all right? I know how to get to the secret worlds, all right? Okay, so when you so when you have a meeting with Microsoft, what's the Microsoft Ask T-shirt? Do you have like some type of Minecraft thing going on? No, I might even wear like my Nintendo, like my Super Mario shirt. Oh, just to rub it in. <laughs> I don't have I don't have enough of those shirts. I don't I don't, I don't have. I probably need some more of them. But I, I have I have you know some video game shirts and some comic book shirts, like these comic books back here, and you know that video game right there. Amen. I I use the one Pokemon shirt for our first episode. Um, so I have no other tricks up my sleeve. I already just used the Sleep Talk Snorlax shirt. Um, it's new it's funny you say that. My wife gets upset because these are all the shirts I own, right? Like besides. Oh, uh, okay. So like when she wants to go do something here, she's like, stop wearing printed tees. <laughs> <laughs> Graphic tees are, are, are a huge part of the gaming industry. I will say that when I stopped working remote, I stopped buying uh business appropriate t-shirts so if anyone from michigan virtual watches this just understand i'm never coming back to lansing so just have that just have that up front i do much better in an office by myself in this computer with uh whatever t-shirt is fresh so what would you like to talk about today would be my big question of the day i want to talk about the importance of video games in schools i know we've kind of touched on it these last three or four episodes and you and i have obviously talked about it at length and you even started a project on that but i think since we have this opportunity let's discuss that because i think educators and parents need to hear it and students obviously want it to happen because they want to play video games more whenever especially in school so hopefully everybody gets something out of it cool if you had an ideal hmm. Okay, well, here's my first question. What what was the size of your school that you went to when you graduated? What was your what was your graduating class size? I think my graduating class had 400 people in it. 400 people? That's a pretty darn big school. Yeah, it, it was a decent size, maybe 200. You know, it was almost getting closer to 20 years ago now. It was so enough time ago that you forgot. Heard. And, so and I, mine was like 100. Years were not kinds of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about, because a lot of these schools get a lot of different funding and uh, have different experiences based on the size. So in my school, I think we had 130 people in the graduating class and it is getting smaller and smaller every single year looking at those school counts. Um, so do you see... What what do you think is the ideal gaming scenario for all schools, regardless of size? I think regardless of size, every school needs to sincerely try to implement at least some form of gaming and esports into the curriculum. I'm not saying that every class should be about game development, right? I'm not saying that every class should be a Fortnite tournament, but there is math. There's science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics that go into video games. So basically, given any subject matter, there is some way to tie it into a video game to at least make the overall experience that much more engaging. It might not be like, 
100% relevant, but it could be tangentially relevant enough to where the students say, you know what, that's memorable and I appreciate that. Okay. Do you have, I know that you're a Mr. Professor yourself. Do you have examples of like what you're using in your courses? Sure. I'll tell you exactly how my course is set up. So we took no tests. We did no quizzes because uh, it's my I favorite disagree teacher. with the philosophy of making people memorize things that they probably won't use later in life. Um, and I, you know, and to my own detriment, because that meant I had to do a lot more work. It's a lot easier just to just run through a test through, a, you know, Scantrons or whatever the, the 21st century edition of Scantrons are these days. But I, I just had maybe had people all do uh, writing uh, assignments and they would basically use their critical thinking skills to analyze. They would play video games and then do an analysis on that gameplay experience, both like their experience playing the game and then like their uh, critique of the scalability of the game from a demographic standpoint, from a content standpoint, from a price standpoint, from an accessibility standpoint. So that we, the entire time, essentially all we did was play video games, but it wasn't just video games for the sake of video games. It was having them experience it firsthand so they could speak directly and intelligently about that experience. That's fascinating. And I the the price and accessibility has always been top of mind uh, because my high school journey involved a lot of swimming and there's been enough successful swimmers from where I came from that it's not just me that was suffering. Um, there were people that were totally fine to do well, but I had nightmares because I was very slow and I watched a lot of rich kids from neighboring areas start to have their parents buy them fast skins before I did and not have the same issues with the pool breaking down as I did. And now I hear stories about esports attorneys happening in those same high schools, which the, with those same schools that I am referring to right now, where mm -hmm. they have custom uh, setups for their kids, they have less latency issues, less lag, and they're still getting those same types of um, better experiences with enrichment than the kids from smaller schools would do. So how do you scale that down for everyone? Great question. And, you know, that's something that's going to be top of mind for me now that I uh, just recently joined as the chief growth officer for Vessel. Um, Vessel it, over the years has been installing esports experiences at schools you know, around the country. Most recently finished one in Santa Ana, California, which is the largest high school esports and VR installation in the world. Um, but and that community is is historically underserved or, or mm -hmm. it's, it's it's disproportionately Latinx. I don't know if it's historically underserved, at least at, at any rate, I have to be aware of accessibility as I provide these experiences to schools who can afford it, recognizing that there are some schools who can't afford it, which is why what we're looking to do is build more of these facilities almost kind of like a ymca footprint right um, not necessarily a ymca but create community resources where schools will have access to them so now it's just you know either a a bus drive away or maybe it's a virtual access opportunity with with vr headsets or something so that it can be through technology more accessible to those who can't themselves schools can't afford the budget to build out you know, a full blown esports arena or or lab. Even even a lot of the schools that we've partnered with over the past couple of years um, have been able to use funding and, and it might be pandemic specific and how they were able to use it, um, but they've been able to use funding to buy computers for what were four other reasons that ended up being the same computers they use for their esports teams. So I know if there's enough if there's enough reach for it where, where there's a will there's a way they've always said and i found that fascinating because these laptops that i remember the laptops that i grew up with at mm -hmm. the school i remember the dell computers that took 30 minutes to load and it's only a 58 minute course or a 58 minute like hour class so it was like yeah. it was it was not good to use technology at that time did you right. ever have to use any smart boards do you know what smart boards are i did in college you know you could okay. put like a um I don't know, that's the, I guess dumbest or easiest example is like smart markers where they, the marker didn't have any actual ink on it, but like you yeah. on the board, it would show you like yellow or blue yeah. or red. And it um, just took up like all the chalkboard space and wasn't yeah. as fast and you couldn't actually use the internet. Yeah. It's like a great example of like some great idea for technology just not being there and actually used. Um, so I would, I love this idea of esports kind of having twofold 
uh, uses. One to help like start a new club, but then also to upgrade some of the technology that are just in these schools in general. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if you, so, and this is assuming that it's a school that is like a one-to-one Chromebook or tablet school, meaning that they provide every student, um, with that opportunity. But even then that's just a Chromebook. You know what I mean? So like if you were trying to if you were a school that was one to one Chromebook or if you're a kid going there, what games could you play at a competitive level or what software is there to use inside of your school? Well, it's not really the Chromebook at that point. It's really the Internet is determined Mm -hmm. ultimately what you can and can't play. But uh, I forget his name. I was trying to get him to write for my book. But there's a guy. Tyler, I forget his last name, but he works for an IT company, and and that's been his push within the IT, like computer, you know, resupplier for computer parts or uh, computer machines, computers and laptops, is not recommending like these higher end builds of laptops, but you could play basically League of Legends on anything, is what I've been told. I have played it. I'm not very good, so I don't think it matters what kind of machine I use to play League of Legends. I'll still mm-hmm. lose. Uh, but that that specific game, because it's been out for so long, um, they, there's just different versions of it. It's very accessible on any kind of machine, as long as you know the machine boots up. You basically, and you have internet access, you can play um, League of Legends on it. And I think console games um, lend themselves to more accessibility because consoles, generally speaking, are cheaper than three to five thousand mm-hmm. dollar PCs. Yeah, you can go get one used from a pawn shop where you probably can't do the same for a PC. Right. Uh, that's not the recycle path for, for, for PCs. They just they don't end up in they generally don't end up in, in pawn shops. But, yeah, I think anything generally that's on a console, you know, you can bring that in. The other great thing about it is that if a teacher plays video games or the students in the class play video games, you could work mm-hmm. out, you know, kind of a system, a rotating system schedule where you go in and and have each student bring in a console one specific day of the week. That's smart. I was just thinking about how cheap a Switch is and how I just saw the new trailer for the new Pokemon game and how I'm not going to be able to not bring that up at some point this hour. But it would be pretty simple to just get a couple of used Switches, even from a GameStop or somewhere else, uh, and just have them for all of the students. That's actually very fascinating. Uh, do you think think uh, like companies that want their own specific software are actually going to lend themselves to schools? Because Nintendo uh, doesn't want you to be able to play their games on a computer. And it is the biggest gaming company in the world, is it not? So they want you to buy their own software, which means another service a school has to, uh, you know, consider. And then even if these students just want to play Mario, like the school has to vet it, they have to approve it, and it's a totally different software than the computers they already need. So even though it seems like a simple solution, do you get what I'm saying? Where the school's like, well, this is another thing. Why are we getting another thing? It gets ixnade, you know? Yeah, and again, that, I think that goes back to having kind of gaming-focused community centers. For that exact reason, because there is that, I'll call it bureaucracy, but infrastructure that that has the guardrails in place for specific reasons. You want to protect students and their information and all of that. So I get it. Uh, but it does make it difficult to get new software in. And for the life of me, I, I don't understand why Nintendo is not pushing more into the education space. Right. You know, they've got games like uh, Splatoon, which is basically Call of Duty, but with paint. Mm-hmm. Right? As, you know, yep. shoot people, it's whatever. Yep. So they. That I was S rank last time. It's not a big deal. Right, I was right, S rank right. Splatoon 2. You know, you know, that and Mario Kart and Mario Party, those would all fit perfectly in a K through 12 scenario, you know, mm-hmm. elementary, middle school, and high school. So it's it's odd to me that they're missing out on that because they probably could get access to some uh, education focused grant dollars. As, That's a good point. Another gaming company. You know my struggles with the whole idea of getting Nintendo in education. You know that I've been bringing it up. Um, also, the new Pokemon's game is going to be open world and uh, up to four players playing together. So you could actually have people playing together on different Switches. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I'm going to keep on plugging it until we get like two kids to play it with me next year for a job. Uh, I also work from the library. I'm a block away from the library in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And mm-hmm. now when I go in there, I see so many people playing Roblox together. Um, and I don't know how they're there at like, 1 30 in the afternoon on a Tuesday they should be in school but there's like six kids always playing Roblox together so from our previous episode we were talking about libraries becoming the new like gaming cafes Mm -hmm. I mean it's kind of already happening if we could get the software updated you could have there's unlimited potential there agreed you know they typically have significantly better internet than you would find on the average residential home right and then 
you know, philosophically, libraries have always kind of been in, in you know, my mind, like the first metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. it's just not digital. You open a book and go to a different world. So why not turn them into the new metaverse and make them arcades, right? I remember going there and using like microfiche and a bunch of stuff I didn't have in my house. And frankly, in some cases, a bunch of stuff I didn't have in my school. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about metaverse because I'm very concerned that there's a bunch of kids who are just going to think that metaverse is just like a place where you can still buy Nike shoes um, or just like an, or crypto companies trying to make a dollar, um, which I do have. I do have a friend who has a plot on Decentraland and it means absolutely nothing to anyone, but it is pretty cool that he has it. But in the end, what does it actually mean? So like to you. Because you just called the library the first metaverse, and I have no clue what that means. But what what does the metaverse look like to you? I, I think the metaverse is is just uh, an extra reality, right? Like a, a second world, and to use the the game's name, a second life, right? Some other place where you can uh, experience a different persona, uh, engage with other people, and just be in a different reality, like multiple realities or string theory. Let's say you know, I, I don't have enough science background to, to get into the technicals there. Right. But I, I believe that, you know, reading books takes you to a different world. It, you know, you, you envision the characters, you're, you're understanding, you know, what kind of environment they're in, the storyline they're experiencing. And that's why I believe that video games have been a metaverse for decades before Facebook became meta. Because even though this is a single player game, right, mm -hmm. you become Mario, right? Yeah. You collect virtual currencies. Those currencies turn into virtual items. And you go on missions is an entire experience. There's an entire lore around Mario. Mm -hmm. It just happens to not be connected to the internet. It's not a metaverse the same way that World of Warcraft is a metaverse, right? right. Or Fortnite, but it is a metaverse in its own right. So you're saying that it's been around for a while. That's interesting too, because I've seen people spend almost hours on just picking you know what they want their character to look like instead of playing the game and it's made me go crazy but if a person's investing a, like that much time into a game like i'm about to in pokemon violet uh you kind of like are going to dedicate that time into looking a certain way as you go through the game because that is you but you get to also be someone different that's i don't know if i made a point there but that is fascinating i never thought that it was going to um just act be like that we've already had a metaverse so okay so let me let me ask a different question then so that you have less parameters to work around five to ten years from now what does the metaverse look like to the most common person meaning the metaverse that everyone will have access to the internet i think the metaverse is an evolution of the internet and and you just, just tricked like me again internet, where a bunch of people raised a bunch of money in the late 1990s and early 2000s and then mm -hmm. most of those companies don't exist anymore right yet because there was a bust and yet you have trillion dollar companies that were born out of that bust, you'll see the same thing. You know, quite candidly, I don't see a bright future for like the central land, well not the central land, maybe the central land, but like sandbox, I don't think is much of anything. That game has actually been around almost 12 years. Oh really? Like the sandbox is a game. They happened to get into um, the blockchain ecosystem back when it was just blockchain gaming before it was web three or, or NFTs or play to earn right before any of that. Yeah those terms were, were popularized. And so they were first, basically first to market and, and rode the wave up. And now we're one of the, the market leaders, if you will. But I, I have to send an article to you. There was somebody who did like a tour of all the, the most popular uh, metaverses by raise amount and basically just chronicled a vacation through like a series of, of ghost towns, virtual ghost towns. Hmm. Because ultimately, like after the buzz went in, nobody's actually using any of these spaces. So all these dollars go in, there's all these headlines, but it's not the metaverse that's been promoted on, you know, TechCrunch or, or Forbes or, or name your sure. outlet of choice. Yeah, and especially, I mean, just in the gaming industry, not just metaverse specific, there's so many new games that are trying to capture that online audience that will die within weeks. And you never really know as a fan, like which one is going to stick around to put your time into uh, or which one is just going to no longer be playable. Um, that's a great point. You know, yeah. and that, that, like you said, with, that's just with regular games. And if you think of the metaverse as just another reg, another regular game, another game, you know, who's to say that that sandbox will be around here in 12 months once the venture capital money leaves? True. Because we've it, seen the same thing happen with tons of games. Do you remember Nick All-Star Brawls? No. 
Okay, so well, good point. So Nickelodeon came out with their own Smash Bros. esque. Yes, yes. Um, and a lot of my friends played it and had a lot of fun, and they don't play it anymore. And there wasn't that many turtles in it, right? Yes, it did have the Ninja yeah, Turtles. Yeah, I remember that. right. Um, so there's a new game, which is essentially Warner Brothers version of Smash Bros. called Multiverses. Yeah. And I played that with my friends because it's free to play, which is like right. the way to get me to play a game, right? <laughs> um, and this one has hundreds of thousands of active players just on Steam alone, not counting other places. So, mm. I mean, if you would have asked me, it would have I would have seen more people playing a SpongeBob than as another Batman game. But yeah. You just literally never know what's actually going to work well and what not from an outsider's perspective. So why would I invest my time into the metaverse now? Unless I'm trying to make a lot of money. Unless I have a lot of money already and I'm trying to make a lot of money. Marcus, why would I invest time in the metaverse now until it's already more established? Just to understand like the social moment in time, right? Like, like for the sake of history, experiencing it. And, and if you're a technologist, you know, just understanding what what is real versus what is empty hype. Mm. You know, I have an IT degree, and that's that's generally been my philosophy over the last 15 years is like kind of stay at the bleeding edge so I know what's real and what's not. And again, I've been a part of the blockchain Bitcoin ecosystem almost 13 years. So when I see and hear some of this stuff, I roll my eyes because I know what what I basically have seen it. The history within the ecosystem repeat itself. OK. So you so this past crash is something that you think is repeating itself and not. Yeah, it, it literally happened in 2017, 2018. The NFT crash, it was called ICO, initial coin offering. OK, basically, the community found a way to launch coins the same way you would a, a stock, right? An IPO, initial public mm -hmm. offering, ICO. Tons of money went in and a bunch of people got scammed and like 80 percent of the projects were scams like legit like legitimately literally 80 percent if you go look up the numbers they were literal scams rug pulls and we're seeing the exact same thing happen in the nft space yeah i remember watching a couple like short documentary films about uh influencers who were taking advantage of middle school and high schoolers uh who would claim that this is the new uh cryptocurrency to get into it and because they have a reach to a new audience they all just bought into it because they thought it'd yep. be fun um and their plan was to make that coin value of zero and pump and dump for the beginning and then right. they would actually say that after they'd taken all their money um and there's nothing legally a middle school or a high schooler can do about that right. so it's a very it's a very sad space for that because especially i mean but here here's what i'm asking in general specifically in this instance of the the ethereum uh, going down, there was a lot of promises about where the coin would be that they were not able to meet standards wise saying like, this is what we'll be able to do with it. Or this is where the space will be. Now, obviously this sounds like a guy who doesn't know what he's talking about, trying to explain the thing. So feel free to correct me at any time. Right. But I watched yeah, my yeah. friend. You're rolling, go out. You're rolling. I'll let you keep rolling with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there were a lot of promises and then they have these quarterly meetings um, where they have to kind of like report where they're at. And there were so many instances where they had promises for certain dates for certain rollouts that they were not able to meet so for so many times in a row that they almost created their own crash. So is that history repeating itself or is that just the companies uh, just being overexcited about the potential and not being able to deliver to the current market? A little of both, a little of both. I think uh, most people who were in the, the space have joined in the last 12 months. So they don't understand the technology. They're learning the technology as they are coincidentally and simultaneously uh, publicizing themselves as experts in that same technology they learned about six months ago. And I guess to be fair, like I learned about everything that I understood of, of blockchain and crypto very quickly within like a six or 12 month time frame. So maybe, maybe, uh, you know, I'm the, the pot calling the kettle black, but I, I have never, I had this conversation with, with a, a professional colleague. I've never described myself as an expert, not as a Bitcoin expert, not as a blockchain expert, not as an esports expert, not as a sure. gaming expert. Other people have described me as an expert, but I never use that term because I think it's impossible to be an expert in any of those things. They're they're emerging markets like frontier technology. It, the space is evolving so quickly. Right. Like, I, it's impossible. It, I I know people who are subject matter who have subject matter expertise because they've been in the space a long time. Mm -hmm. but they, there are very few and far between experts in the space. OK. Didn't you consider yourself a SME at some point for, I thought you were a web three guy before you were, uh, I, an was, I was blockchain. Guy. So here's the thing. And so that's how it's funny. It's funny. You say that that's how we got in that conversation. This person I had a debate with, 
who I've worked with a couple times over the years. Uh, somebody posted a, 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 uh, a photo from a conference where someone basically had a background image uh, on the presentation that says, if anyone comes up here and tells you they know what the future of the metaverse is, they don't know blank, because this is going to be seen by kids. They don't know blank, right? Mm -hmm. So I shared that on LinkedIn because I agree with that. Again, it's so emerging that no one knows what it's going to look like, right? right. We, we could be Ready Player One or, or any number of things. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It could be just a fad here. Just like, I mean, the internet survived, but not the way it was promised 20 years ago. The World mm -hmm. Wide Web, World Wide Web didn't happen. Right. right. So what I was telling this individual was that in the middle of that hype and that kind of 2017, 2018 ICO bubble, it got so frothy as a space that brands just started adopting the word blockchain to capitalize on the hype. Specific example, there was a company, I think in New Jersey, it was a uh, iced tea company, uh, Long Island iced tea or some kind of iced tea company. They added blockchain into their business's legal name and they were publicly traded and their stock price, I wouldn't say exploded, but had a significant measurable uptick Okay. because the, the larger market didn't understand what blockchain was, but they understood that everybody was talking about it. And so right. it was important to be associated with blockchain, just the way you were describing earlier. Yeah. And so then the SEC, ironically, then delisted that stock off the stock exchange. So in the middle of all that happening, uh, one of my other colleagues who has worked in the ecosystem a long time, we were joking back and forth. Like, yeah, we should put blockchain in our name just to mock as a parody of that other blockchain. So I did that and ironically just started getting a bunch of like unsolicited inbound business opportunities. But I was also, again, mocking people who were using blockchain as that expert title, because again, I never call myself uh, blockchain. People, I've been in a conference where someone called me blockchain. Hey, back there, it's Mr. Blockchain. But I, you've never- got called Mr. Blockchain? I was at a venture capital conference in 2018. Okay. And the keynote speaker, I don't remember what it was he said in advance, because I wasn't really paying attention, but then he pointed to the back of the room, because I was not trying to draw attention to myself. Right. He's like, go ask Mr. Blockchain. He like okay. pointed across the conference to me at the back of the room. And you decided not to put that on a t-shirt and sell that with your book because you could wear that under the vest and it would be, that could be your aesthetic. Is all I'm saying. I, I could, you know, you know, there's still time. There's still time. Okay. <laughs> so long, long story short, uh, you know, I've, I've never considered myself a, a expert because I know there's too much to know. And, and that's, that's the only thing I know is there's more that I don't know. Um, but I guess the long story short is that, I think that there are a lot of people who don't understand the ecosystem, who purport to know the ecosystem mm. and that there's more hype than there is substance. That's a great mentality to take into the esports space, because I could tell you, just like I know everything that's been reported about Pokemon and maybe even some leaks that I'm not supposed to know about for the upcoming game. If you were to ask me about Starcraft, like our last uh, our last guest speaker did, I would know nothing and act like a like a, a kid who's just trying to learn a new language. Right. Uh, and, and and for esports, that's how a lot of these clubs started. I actually just had a former colleague reach out and she's the athletic director uh, and the club. And she asked me, she was like, hey, how do we start an esports club? And I was like, I don't know. I just like Rocket League. I just like one game out of the thousands, which is why, you know, if you're a kid, it's kind of important for the kid to come first in these esports things. Because when we talk about Mario Kart being a possibility or Mario Party being a possibility, that's an esport. Uh, yeah. to the people that like it. I've thrown Mario Kart parties um, that were based around adults having adult fun and playing Mario Kart, uh, and I'm undefeated. But if those same people wanted to play Smash Bros or a different game, I'm getting destroyed every single time. Mm -hmm. So all of these schools only have to be an esports-based school by just playing any game. Is that a fair is that a fair sentence? You play any game in your esports school? That that's fair. It's unpopular and I have a lot of people who will argue with me till they're blue in the face, especially on LinkedIn. You may have seen some of those. Debates. Okay. But I believe that any game and actually every game has esports potential, even single player games because you don't hear that same criticism of single person sports in the Olympics like javelin throwing or shot right. Play, right? Those are legitimate sports that they compete in, in a, a series, but not mm -hmm. simultaneously. So I think you could do the same thing with speed runs. And you and I talked about yeah. speed runs, but you know, taking that perspective, as long as it you can track the time the level is completed, or if there's some score you get at the end of the level or some number of items that you have to collect, really anything within the game, as long as you put whatever that thing you choose on a leaderboard, you can turn that specific instance of it into an esport. 
And I think more, more specifically, it doesn't matter which games are popular. Ultimately, it matters which games your students, we're talking from a school perspective, want to play, right? Mm -hmm. If Valorant, if you're in middle school, I guess Valorant is not a really good example. I'm not sure what that's rated. So if that game or, mm -hmm. or if Mario Kart, right, yeah, is okay. super popular, but none of the students want to play Mario Kart, then why would you yeah. implement Mario Kart into the school? No one's going to play it. So yeah. the easiest thing to do is just ask the students, hey, what games are you playing? What games would you like to play for fun or prizes? And then you build your program off of that. You know that they will be engaged because they self-identified as gamers and they mm -hmm. told you what games they want to play. Yeah. Then you have the opportunity to introduce Mario Kart and when you're older, some of these other games that I'm not supposed to mention. I have I have friends who just started playing video games like in their 30s and they love playing video games. Um, but there are some that they will stay away from. The moment that it's a 3D game and not a platforming game, it's just like too much for them. And they're like, oh, I'm not a gamer. I was like, we just played 12 hours and finished a game together. You don't just get to say, you're just picking and choosing like we all do. Like all the websites, like, I don't know. So I, I guess I guess my thought is um, I don't want companies telling me what uh, blockchain or the metaverse is going to be when it'll just happen. And I wouldn't, as a student, want a principal telling me what esports looks like. I mm -hmm. want to play the games I want. And there's no, and that should be done within school parameters because that's the best place to encourage that. Agreed. I believe that what we should see is, is, to your point, not dictating what games they can play and what the structure looks like, but more so providing the tools and, and then letting them pick the things that resonate mm -hmm. with them. That's the entire reason we've been having this esports conversation, because we want increased engagement in education. If you're teaching yeah. just the regular way and it's not engaging the students, but they're voluntarily spending all their free time playing video games, why not try to teach with video games? <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it seems so simple. Uh, I got to be honest, this entire time, I know we talked about this before, but I tried making bread. And I guess this is a good rule for middle schoolers is don't put a quarter cup of salt in the bread that you're making because my mouth tastes like the ocean. So I appreciate you taking a lot of the time on these answers because the I'm just trying to get as much water in here as possible because it is, I feel like my head might be twice the size in an hour. I have no clue what's going on. Um, but yeah, so if... Here's another great example. Would you know how to explain the rules of cricket? No. Me neither. Yeah. That's it's this there's so many examples of things in real life that exemplify themselves greatly in esports. It's almost like speaking a new language sometimes when you're picking up these new games, but competition happens uh, inside the school and outside the school all the time, regardless of if it's a sport or not. So like I I mean, I remember even in uh, math class like you would they would the teacher would literally have two kids come up and try to solve the same multiplication problem and whoever did it faster like got it like they moved in a tournament i was like all right well you're just like uh you're just a math sport you're just a math sports org at this point you know what right. i mean right. and i wasn't as fast as some of the girls in multiplying and that made me feel bad for the rest of the day but i got better so here we are you know so it worked yeah. the same way that you can get better at games um yeah. so 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 tournament wise what do you think the simplest way that if every kid, because we're a Michigan based company, if every kid in the state of Michigan were to be offered uh, an access into some type of competition or tournament, what would that look like to you? What would the tournament structure look like? Sure. Game structure, everything. Take me sure. through. What would you uh, think? It's, it's the same thing we've been saying, right? You know, the state of Michigan sends an email out to all the students or their parents, okay. on how that, whatever the age of the student is, and says, hey, we want kids to start playing video games within the community because we want within the educational community because we want to get video games more closely embedded into the educational experience. Uh, click here and please let us know what games they play. And then when they sign into whatever the platform is, the game is there and then they can go. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze here. Oh, it's just one sneeze. Sometimes it's two. <laughs> I so, could have muted you, and I chose not to. I wanted that to be part of the podcast. So just so you know. they they um, they log in, they see the game that they like to play, and then they invite their friends to play video games with them through that tournament, which is the same thing that people have been doing for decades, right? Like the only difference between then and twenty years ago is like I would go across the street to my neighbor's house, my brother, my sister, and I, and all the neighbors would pile in to like these two tiny couches and just pass the controller around because we all like playing the game. It was an opportunity to socialize. 
those are some of the first true esports before you had like even tournament brackets within esports. People were playing esports in their own homes and in their neighborhoods. And then it went to the arcades because you could play games in the arcade that you couldn't get at home, right? And then now we have what we call, you know, modern esports today is, is so much more structured and polished, and that's great. But we don't have to get away from that, the simple formula that has worked for decades. Yeah, I guess this is just like the next evolution of how games will be included in schools regardless, right? Yeah, you know, like like recess, right? Like, uh, and I don't know if recess is gone now. I think, you know, PE has, has gone. Depends on the school. Way. It's a bit of a touchy subject. <laughs> but there, there's no reason why you couldn't split uh, recess in half. Like do 20 minutes of physical activity and then 20 minutes of virtual activity because it, it is still a sport. It just happens within like your eyes and your hands instead of your entire mm -hmm. body. I can think of so many complaints coming from so many teachers about that already, what you just said. That's that's the hard part of education is there's so many things to break down so many times. Because if you take away, I mean, think about think about how quickly I talk right now just from eating too much salt bread. Imagine like third grade me just running around and not getting that playtime. Like you need playtime as well. And a lot of schools do take that away. And it's uh, it's probably not best for the students. Um, no. But yeah, even I like have two young kids and I can't keep them in the house all day. They have to go outside. Have to go out. Yeah, I talked about swimming before. Uh, the reason I got into swimming is because my mom used to make me run around when I was a kid, and so did my dad. Uh, and we grew up in Michigan, so you can't make them run in the winter. So I got put in a pool where it was indoors, and that's yeah. it. That's the entire story. Was, we well, we can't make them run in the winter. This is child cruelty. So we'll make them go in a pool and swim around instead. Right. And that was the whole evolution into me getting in. Um, but what about this? I mean, like think about all the kids that have to wait for a bus or an after-school program. I mean, mm -hmm. think about how more organized and fun that room would be um, if there were just two switches there. And that's the thing, too, is like a lot of these games are just as fun to watch as they are to play, especially something on the Switch like Smash Brothers, right? Or mm -hmm. Mario Party. So you don't yeah. have to go worry about like if kids are getting bored sitting at whatever activity you have them doing or just sitting there and wandering around the school or, or wherever. They're right. all going to be like magnetized around the video game. You yeah. might have to like pry them away from the video games to put them on the bus or put them in their program or put them exactly. in their cards. Yeah, that'll be if the hard part is it's time to go, then you're doing a good thing. Yeah. Um, I also it's it's pretty popular to just watch people in any setting. It's not just I'm, I'm concerned that a lot of people just think it's like Twitch streaming when we talk about watching others play video games. Mm -hmm. um, I watched my friends play every single video game that I'm still drawn to now. Uh, whether it was Pokemon, Kingdom Hearts, all of that type of stuff. Didn't have any Call of Duty games growing up. I watched my friends play. Mm -hmm. um, was happy to not be in those lobbies, to be honest. I would not have been good with the smack talk. I'm very thin-skinned, an emotional guy. But um, th even nowadays in Discord, like all of my friends and a bunch of other people all have their own rooms where they can just be like, hey, want to hang out? And then we'll just watch someone like play this game to see what they're doing. And that's how we all learn to get through a game so we can all get to the same spot so we can play together. Like even, even if it's outside of the school, people are going to find ways to do this regardless. It might as yeah. well just be in the school because it'll be better for everyone. I have two stories. One, one of my neighbors at the end of my neighborhood uh, had an older brother. And so he had Doom because he was like 17 when we were mm -hmm. uh, 10. And during the summer, his, you know, his parents were at work and there was no school. We would basically, my brother and my sister and I would go over to his house and he wasn't allowed to have people in his house when his parents weren't home. Because uh -huh. rightfully so, right? Right. His brother was at school or college or something. The game was still installed on the computer. He was playing, oh, I can't mention the name of this game. He was playing a, a first person shooter uh, with someone who had a buzz cut and, and, and shades. Uh, right. And he would just basically <laughs> stand on the front porch and like, stare through his front house windows at the screen like he couldn't invite us in the house but he was still basically like that was streaming before youtube was yeah <laughs> and that was and that was essentially how a lot of people watch television when televisions weren't popularized in every single home is they would see it in the screens of like a, a shop and watch it that's how a lot of pay-per-views got watched you know, everyone talks about like all these great boxing matches, but realistically, not everybody was at home buying those pay-per-views. They right. were like out in the streets, either listening to it or watching it through windows. So it just, you know, history repeats itself. There we go. So we'll, we'll expect another what uh, Ethereum crash in like 2026 or something yeah, like that. Basically, so. basically get ready for it. So the, the other story was uh, I was in magnet school and my brother and I learned that we could put, well, two things. One. So these are two separate stories. One, we learned that you could put video games on the TI-83 plus graphing calculator. Yeah. 
right? And that's why I started teaching myself to code was because uh -huh. we were building our own games on the calculators. And then separately, we recognized that like the IT administrators didn't have the network drives locked down. So we brought games from our house, the handful of games that we had, one of them was Descent, uh, and we installed it on the network drive at high school so that we could play the game from any computer on, on the school campus. Now, I'm not advocating for or, or condoning that to students if you're watching. But yep. what I'm saying is that that was another instance where the school could have leveraged that misbehavior uh, to, to reinforce network security, right? Instead of yep. reprimanding me, which they did, like, A, create an environment where I could play the game, and then mm -hmm. B, like, leverage that to teach me more about IT security and have me help go fix it. Right. To whatever extent they can do that without like giving me the ability to go undo whatever change it was they needed to make. Because people like you are going to test those boundaries regardless. And I will say you're not alone. I played all of Pokemon Red on uh, a TI-83. I don't know if it was a plus or whatnot, but I played that through a lot of school. So yeah. um, I hear you there. And that was my first time. I was like, wait, how do you get this game on this calculator? Is there more use for math than I originally thought? So it actually opened my eyes up a lot. Yeah. Um, you said magnet school? Yeah, magnet school. I was in a magnet school for science technology. Um, I don't know if this is a nationwide kind of structure, but typically, uh, at least in Georgia, because I've seen some of them in Georgia where I'm from, um, they would create a school that was focused on, sometimes they're focused on arts and sometimes science technology, like the one I went to, where um, typically what happens is it's if it's in a county with three high schools, the low income school gets the funding to improve the educational impact for the students in the program and hopefully over time all the students and so the school i went to was not the low-income district out of the the three high schools so they would take students from that high school were able to get into the program from my high school and another high school which was higher income than the one that i was at all of us all of our students we students went to that school and we basically did like like scientific projects and like chemistry and actually i got um AP calculus credit um, in, oh, wow. in high school, I think actually as a sophomore, I got an AP calculus credit because it was basically an accelerated, you know, academic program. Yeah. So they're trying to just improve academics within the county, but starting at that school. Okay. And it, I think it had a partnership with Georgia Tech at any rate, uh, magnet school, just kind of a specialized curriculum around a the theme. And that magnet school's theme was science technology. That's interesting. I thought you said magnets as in the things that attract each other. And I was trying to think like, what school did you and your brother go to? That was the main focus. I was like, what are they teaching out in Georgia? I have no clue. Um, wow. So are there any last thoughts about esports and using more games for education before we wrap this up? No, I, I think that you teachers and parents would be surprised at how many games are out there already that do this, right? I think you and I had talked about Code Combat. It's a website that you can actually for free go and learn to code by playing a video game. It's kind of like a, a side-scrolling 2D retro game, but instead of you controlling the character with a keyboard and mouse or a controller, you type in code, lines of code, and you watch on one side the program execute the lines of code, and on the other side, the, most of the screen is the actual game where you see the impact of the code you wrote. So it would be like character dot walk right five spaces. You pass in the number five. And then on the screen, you would see your character walking right five spaces. And you just kind of, there are different challenges. And as you go through, it teaches you programming principles, um, value assignment with variables and for loops and if statements, things that I today still use as a coder, but the, the fundamentals of it, which really apply to all languages, but you learn it here in a gamified setting. So it's it's easier to learn, it's fun, and it, it leverages you know the interest in video games to get the kids there. And if you go to the website, you'll see the impact that that type of programming has created. That's a huge website. And I also will go ahead and be a proponent of Duolingo. I'm kind of late to the game, uh, but they they have gamified the element, uh, the system pretty well to where I know to wake up in the morning and the first thing to do is to do one lesson so that I get my early bird XP so that in the evening I can use that XP to get double points on the big ticket items so that I'm on a leaderboard that I might get out of gold rank to emerald rank by the end of this week. So they've done a really good job of keeping me engaged. And I think a lot of kids would like it too. And it's a lot of stuff that I forgot in high school, which is kind of, you know, if you're a high school, you might as well use Duolingo as part of it. And I have always been fascinated about, you know, how, how you could gamify new languages and stuff like that. So I, I think we should go ahead and just get out of here. We will have another, a new guest speaker next week. 
-hmm. we will be here again. Uh, if anyone's interested in the course, we can go in the descriptions below. And uh, Marcus, have a nice week. I'll see you next I, week. Before we leave, just very quickly, I want to show this image. I think you, you've seen it. I've shared it with you. Okay. Uh, this is not my image, but I did get licensed for my book. There are 100, over 100 STEAM-related professions or professions in general, but many of them dealing with technology in some capacity in the gaming and esports industry. Things that you would assume like broadcasting and, and obviously playing for tournaments and content creation, but also things you wouldn't consider like traditional businesses like accounting and law, right? All of those here. So I think it's important for teachers and parents to see that you can set your kids slash students up for career success and personal success with gaming and esports. Yeah, there's a lot of that's very accepted in the sports world where you might not be able to play for the team, but you can work for the team. And it's very it's no different in esports, just more of it a grassroots movement. Yeah. Um, so I totally agree. And thanks for sharing with that. Marcus, I'll see you next week. Talk to you later. See you. Thanks.